Thank you for the organizers very much for inviting me for this workshop. And um, I'll be talking not only on biomechanics, but uh, also on other aspects in uh, motion planning. And I would like to talk about the idea of how you want to compose a geometrical and uh, optimization approaches to address different aspects of motion planning and also motor execution. So basically, this is of course, we would like to understand how the human's plan represent control and execute movements. I will talk mostly about 2D and 3D hand. I will not talk too much about 3D, but uh, 2D hand drawing and locomotion trajectories. Uh, I'll talk about task space kinematics. And uh, one topic I want to talk about besides compositionality, which is the idea that you compose complex movements from motor primitives, is, is the topic of, of timing. So I think in motor control research, Timing somehow is uh, the issue of time representation and time selection in planning is somehow neglected. So uh, I will not talk only about internal timing, but also on the issue of how you select duration for different times. So basically, the outlook is I will start with talking about geometrical approaches to modeling trajectories and the idea of moving frames that is uh, taken from a little time. Uh, and this is uh, how we can use it also for primitives to de uh, decompose complex movements into different primitives of motion. But here also we will show how we can combine geometrical and optimization approaches. I will then talk about timing, basically the idea of how we select movement for duration, movement duration and, the, uh, and conservation laws, not only on time but also then um, I'll talk about internal timing, and, and I want to end uh, up with topics of uh, compositionality at joint space level. So uh, just a brief introduction of the idea of primitives. We have this idea that you construct behaviors of primitives, even though some movements might be continuous. And a very important topic is the idea of invariance. So we know movements are very invariant in terms of uh, having the same kind of characteristic of trajectories for different tasks or for different aspects of behavior. So basically, we'd like to know what are the invariants, what are the templates or the primitives, and what kind of tactic rules the brain is using to construct complicated movements. And the idea that is in physics was very strong, but also recently become strong in neuroscience is the idea of geometrization. So the idea that the brain is a geometry machine. Uh, I think uh, Daniel Benneken mentioned Linus, but I think Kundering said it before Linus. Uh, so the idea is that you have geometry represented in space, and it's important not only for vision, but also for motor. And in physics, uh, people have started using it, uh, using Riemannian geometry, but there's also other kind of geometry. I know Daniel de McCann was talking here in Toulouse, but maybe I'll emphasize some different aspects of the work. And um, we would like to ask what kind of geometry the brain using in uh, perception and action, uh, how we represent time, because time is connected to space very strongly, so how to represent time in the brain, maybe again using a geometrical approaches, and what is the relation between space and time. So uh, this is uh, going back to the old work, not old, but very nice work of, uh, of uh, Francesco Laconiti, Viviani, and Tertuolo when they looked at the complicated trajectories, and they say that they obey uh, kinematic laws of motion, i.e. they looked at the geometry of motion and the radius of curvature and curvature of a complicated trajectory like figure 8 and say how is the velocity actually relates to the radius of curvature or freedom curvature and they came up with what they call uh, the two-thirds power law which is the angular velocity is piecewise related to the cur radius of curvature to the power two-thirds you can express it also with velocity and radius of curvature and you can see it also if you plot it in log log uh, space, you see pieces that have the same what they call velocity gain factor. This is the k that remains a 
that this was false term. Uh, and so this was a very intriguing idea for us. The old work we did with Viviani and Richardson a long time ago, we showed that if you have a second principle like maximum smoothness, starting with minimum acceleration, jerk, snap, etc., the two thirds parallel is actually equivalent to having a minimum or maximum smooth trajectories. Uh, and you test it by testing the values of beta. More recently, I became in the, in a, in a interested in the idea that maybe this law comes somehow from geometry, and I'm going to some all the work done with uh, Amir Hansen and uh, Polyakov that we said that if the movement is done as a constant equilibrium velocity, I'll tell you in a minute what is equilibrium, you have uh, this is the velocity equilibrium, this gives us a, the one third parallel. Or the total power of the point in what formalism. And the basic idea is that the brain does not necessarily think in Euclidean space. Maybe it's using under geometry, which is non Euclidean, could be a fine, equilibrium fine projective to represent space. And it's very, very related to the work in done in vision, where people like Kundering and Todd and others show that uh, you can. That the brain perceives a uh, visual motion and other and visual objects using uh, a fine geometry, uh, where if I if I move far enough, what you will see is a photographic projection, uh, and this is equivalent to having an a fine extra fine uh, geometry. So maybe it also has an important role in the move, movement production. And this somehow nicely ties to the work of Enrique Cartan, who talks about a parallel to social sleep, representing movement or the dot or something, rather than use the um, social sleep or the algebra, you can use it with what they call Cartan moving frame, where you have a dot moving in space and you have a coordinate frame attached to the dot and you can move between different representation of a coordinate frame using what they call a Cartan matrix. And so just for illustration, if I'm on this dot here moving here, and I have I can have a Cartesian coordinate system with a tangent uh, direction from the tangent to the curve and the normal curve, and I can uh, have a dot moving and I can trace this um, curve with a Cartesian coordinate space, and then you have the what we call Cartan matrix depends on the curvature. But you can also have another coordinate frame, for example, the equilateral coordinate frame, when the tangent is the same direction, but the normal is not 90 degrees or not orthogonal to the uh, tangent. They only create a parallelogram that preserves the area. So that's what we have: equilateral geometry. And this is the same thing here. If you take a trapezoid and translate it, uh, rotate it, and you change the shape, you preserve the area, and uh, parallel lines remain parallel. So if you preserve a said area, it's called equiaffine. If you don't have preservation of area, you call it general affine. Okay? So you can show mathematically that you can define a new metric of distance, which is the regular Cartesian metric, weighted by a power of curvature to the one third. And that shows you that you, if you move at a constant equilibrium velocity, you actually get the one third power law. Okay? You should also know that you can define equilibrium curvature and curves that have a zero fine curvature, positive or negative, are the cones. Okay? So this is an idea. And what we did is we, we, uh, Hans, uh, we took the growing movement of people, we transform it into equilibrium velocity, and you see basically that we generate complicated trajectory with just constant equilibrium velocity. So this is a much simpler representation than looking at the equilibrium velocity. Is that good enough? So what happens if we move in different distances in space? Here you move different distances, and we know that roughly we have the same duration for different distances. That's called uh, global isochrony, the principle, uh, isochrony principle. And so 
it is not explained by a constant equivalent velocity. To expand that, we have to, to move to another geometry. So a more general geometry will be full of fine geometry. And in full of fine geometry, in a circle and ellipse, we have the same fine, full of fine arguments. Okay? So that means that if I have the same duration and we have a constant fine velocity, that means I have the same duration for different shapes that are achieved right under a fine transformation. Okay, and this is what we call fine geometries going from similarity, Euclidean, a fine is larger, and topological, and on the way I forgot projective, but these are called fine geometries. And we can use it to describe different transformation of objects and also motion. So fine environment uh, translation of attention and stretching, equia fine preserve area, and Euclidean is just invariant under translation of attention. So um, what does it imply with respect to time? It says that if I move at a constant of fine the, uh, velocity, that means the time will be preserved for different movements that are undergoing a uh, full of fine transformation. Okay? So with Daniel Benekem and uh, Alain Bertoz and Ronit Fuchs, we developed a model, a model that says, okay, so I don't have one geometry, I have a mixture of several geometries. In each geometry, geometry time is proportional to the geometrical arc length with some constant. And what we have is a multiplicative model where beta is the weight of each geometry in the model, and the sum of the betas are equal to 1. And we can represent it by what we call equal fine and fine equilibrium geometry. And we have a prediction of the velocity. And uh, we can also treat with singularity points. Singularity points are points where we have either inflection point, zero curvature, or zero equal fine curvature, fine curvature. That. And then we, can, we use that model to account for what people are doing in either uh, locomotion or drawing. So basically, we fit to each, this, the experimental data is black for this curve, and then we predict for it the constant fine geometry, which is the, uh, the green line, a uh, red line, and the green line is the constant equia line, and we ask which kind of beta will give us the real experimental velocity. So the idea is here that you don't generate the whole thing with one segment, but actually you have multiple segments. So we find the beta by finding the best, the best beta that fits the data. And uh, this is just showing what we do experimentally, mathematically. And we found that for drawing movement, for example, we have a combination of the red is a fine geometry, and green is equifine, and blue is Euclidean. So it's not, we don't need Euclidean geometry for drawing. And uh, for locomotion, we found the opposite, that the combination of equifine and uh, Euclidean give us a good model of the behavior. That's the same trajectory with locomotion. And this is just showing you that with complicated trajectories, you can really regenerate the data for locomotion and drawing. And these are showing you the different betas that we need for different shapes. So double ellipse, clover ellipse, etc. And also the distribution of the different betas among people. And I'll skip that. Okay, so in conclusion, we have this uh, model that generates trajectories based on different geometries. That you can uh, model both locomotion and drawing with this kind of geometries and that we can find segments that underlie complicated behavior with this kind of combined geometries. Okay? Now we can use this approach to actually uh, infer the segments of the trajectories. And we assume, not only do we assume that we have this mixture, but we assume that we actually use a fine geometry and we have orbits that the actual basic units are orbits of these different geometries. So orbits is what we get when we have this uh, position RP is exponent 
to the power a t. A is the matrix of the geometry of motion. It's either Euclidean or depends what geometry we're talking, or a sine or a sine. Some initial position are zero. So we can find or parameterize the whole trajectory by this kind of orbit. Okay. So here are examples of different orbits, Euclidean, which is a circle because we have a constant Euclidean curvature, and the matrix depends on Euclidean curvature. They have equiaffine and general orbit. And the next thing is we can do this for the different geometries. And then what we wanted to do is to combine this mathematical tool with the mixture of geometry models. So we have a model that we have parameterization of distance to this description that I told you before. And we express this idea of using a fine orbit with this new parameterization. Okay? So we parameterize trajectory combining the minimum jerk, for example, and this idea of orbits. And we ask what kind of orbits will give us the smoothest possible trajectories. Okay? So I won't go into this, but the the to have minimum jerk, we have a scalar product between the R to the sigma. This sigma is any parameter multiplied by scalar product with the sixth order derivative of R with respect to sigma. And when you do that, you can define what are the betas that will you give you the different geometries, the different trajectories. And this defines us a group of orbits. So, for example, monomials are orbits of the affine geometry. Uh, circles are orbits of the Euclidean uh, geometry. Ellipses, parabols, and, uh, um, and uh, hyperboles are orbits of the equifine geometry. And so we can now use it to segment complicated trajectories. So for example, we have this kind of trajectory. We use this mathematical description to segment the trajectory, and we get trajectory that are invariant under a fine transformation. So uh, this is one result. Another result is to assume that you don't only minimize jerk, but you want to have a minimization of jerk and accuracy. Okay? So you have some kind of some template of trajectory that follows minimum jerk. And you have some perturbation under the initial condition or the final condition, or you want to get as smooth as trajectory as possible to some displaced trajectories. So when you solve that, you get a solution. This is a paper that was published recently in IEEE Robotics and Automation. The solution is the template, which is the minimum jerk, and a sum of six orbits following this expression. These are fine orbits. So any trajectory can be generated by having a smooth template and corrected online in real time by just adding these fine orbits. Okay? So this is very actually useful. I think Lotte uh, worked with uh, CONFAM on, uh, on uh, fine correction of perturbation. It's an alternative idea. So you can have a template and some orbit summation, and you can correct the trajectory. Okay? So why am I doing this? Now? 20 minutes. Okay, so now I have I do, uh, do the work on uh, the, uh, the geometrical approach to movement. Now we want to move to another dimension that is very important, which is timing. So there is very little literature about how time is, what time selected in movement. So we have a fixed law when we have a speed accuracy trade off. We have an infinite horizon. I know Emma did some paper on infinite horizon selection, and other people. But the question do we have, can we think about other approaches to select time? So uh, with Matan, Matan here, uh, Matan Karlinski. This is my first dog, was my PhD before. First, we wanted to see what happens if we do a complicated trajectory made of several pieces. How independent are the different pieces in planning the trajectory? 
And then we wanted to move to the question, how do you select duration for the intensity? So uh, what we have, we have people drawing this drawing, which is made of three pieces of ellipses. And we wanted to see what happens if we keep the two, two segments with the same constant, the same size, and only one part is growing larger. So this is uh, larger or bigger, bigger or smaller. So you change only one segment, and then you will see what's happening with the timing of the different segments. So basically what we found is that this a part of the segment, when it becomes bigger, the duration becomes larger, and the other segment, the duration becomes smaller. Generally, summing up. But the total duration keeps us looking. So the total duration remains the same, but different duration of different segments are not independently planned. So basically, the idea is, you see it here, this is duration increases for the segment that gets big, bigger and the other segments, the duration gets smaller. So if you had only an online planning that's composed of different segments independent, you wouldn't have this phenomenon. Only a model that you have a pre-plan for the entire trajectory will have this kind of phenomena. And indeed, we took the minimum jerk model and introduced these uh, three segments and we show that you could introduce this behavior by just uh, assuming a pre-planned trajectory for the entire trajectory with minimum character. Okay. Now, another thing that we wanted to ask is how do you select total duration? So basically, there is a recent paper by uh, Stiznowski and you, Stiznowski, that talked about uh, meter law. Okay, meter law are laws that talk about conservation under symmetry, different symmetry. So what they say, if you minimize just, for example, and you want to have a trajectory that is invariant under translation, rotation, and uh, scaling, for example, okay, so you can find out what is the duration, that's the paper, basically the, the idea is that if you have a total cost for the entire plan, you can define a, a, cost that, a constant that's called drive. Now, if you if the derivative of the total cost with respect to total duration uh, is invariant, remains constant, that means that the drive is constant. Okay? So, the, using this formalism, you can derive the theoretical prediction about drive for different kinds of costs. Now, uh, so for example, for minimum jerk, you can derive the total drive, you can do it for minimum acceleration. Also, we showed in another paper that even if you have a com complicated trajectory made of segments, but you continuously plan the whole thing through Viapol, for example, the drive for each segment would be the same. So, um, we also generalized this work, their work to thinking about other symmetries. So, they talked about time symmetry. But you also have translation symmetry, rotation symmetry, and scaling. And each one of them will have a, con a constant of motion, a conservation mode. So if you know, you assume some optimal control, you have a constant that is predicted by the cost that you optimize, and you actually can test it for experimental data. So that was the question. What kind of optimal control you have? You can predict the conservation law and the constant of motion and say, is that constant preserved or not? Okay. So what we did is we went, and Matan here derived the expression for drive, for jerk minimization, acceleration, snap, etc. And uh, let me skip. And then we tested whether the drive, which is proportional to the length uh, in minimum acceleration, jerk, or snap, with different parallels, is indeed conserved for human movement. Now, here we disagree with uh, Sidnowski and you because they say for reaching that uh, what is conserved for reaching. Uh, we found that it's not conserved. Okay. So we're now testing why is the explanation that drive is not conserved and does not obey this law for minimum acceleration, for example, and minimum jerk. We also did the same thing for ellipses. 
And again, we found that drive is not conserved for ellipses. So there can be different possibilities to explain, even though the minimum jerk gives a very good prediction to the data, well, we don't have a conservative for this. Okay. So finally, I just want to present something quickly uh, about modularity and compositionality. So, of course, we can have primitives at different levels of the system. We can have uh, we can have primitives with the edit factor, we can have primitives with joints, we can have primitives with muscle, but the question is, do we, what's the law of translation between the different primitives? Or we move from the different primitives? So, uh, this is work done with Lars Omler, with Martin Giese, and with my student, Avi Borilia. Uh, so, just to mention, this is again work coming from Lacuaniti and Yuri Vanenko and the Vela, and they found that they have this intersegmental law of coordination. When you look at human locomotion and you have this reduction of degrees of freedom to, from 3 to 2, only if you look at the elevation angle with respect to gravity and you don't look at the uh, anatomical angle or rotation angle. Now, with Avi, we uh, found that if you uh, describe each degree of freedom with a simple uh, a simple sine wave even, you have and what you can ask under what condition you have this kind of intersegmental law or plane. And you can also calculate the orientation of the normal to the plane depending on the phases between the different oscillators on the amplitude. And we use that in uh, also looking recently at patients, Parkinson patients, etc. Uh, now, we wanted to do a similar approach to the human arm. Again, you have a redundancy, and we looked at the four degrees of freedom arm, three at the shoulder, one at the elbow. When people are doing complicated trajectories, and again, you can look at them in terms of uh, absolute coordinates, where with respect to gravity and the azimuth, or you can look at the anatomical coordinates. Okay. And we have people tracing this complicated curve. So now, instead of using a simple oscillator, we use the approach that was developed by the lab of Gize, which is using an echoid mixture of, X of uh, basis function, where you have synergy of base function, the same basis function for each joint, displaced by some phase between the different joints, some by constant uh, coefficients. So actually, we use this, uh, this approach to look both at joint angle and at the vector angles, okay? And we found that if, I'll give you the bottom line, we found that if you use an absolute uh, angles and not an anatomical angle, we can have the same sources describe both end vector and joint trajectory. With linear, again, you take out the phases, you have a linear summation of sources both for the end vector and for the joints. So this actually enables you to resolve the redundancy by linear transformation, and this way you resolve inverse kinematics. So if you share the sources for both zones, and hand and use uh, absolute coordinates, you can actually solve the inverse kinematics. So this is the question, does the brain use this strategy? We don't know. But we actually recently collaborated it with another algorithm developed at the lab of uh, Giza, which is the FAD algorithm, and developed by Enrico. And uh, again, so we have this inverse kinematics, and we can have this the same sources for both end effector and joint. And we found that there is a very nice mapping between the two. And also, we found some freezing between the different, uh, of, of freezing or locking, what we call phase locking between the end effector and the joint if we use this description. So, this is an idea that if you have a basis function, same for the end effector and for the joint. You can use them to solve the inverse kinematic with taking care into the phase. So, in summary, 
and combine geometrical and optimization models to modern hand and center of mass trajectory for both locomotion in uh, hand. We have predicted the uh, total movement duration and internal timing. Internal timing was predicted for minimizing the cost function. Total movement duration can, the, can show dependency on, on the distance if you have metal law and conservation laws, but unfortunately, the data does not support this kind of assumption. So the question is why? Because you minimize gradients against a good model, or you minimize acceleration, and you still don't have this conservation. And finally, there is this new model of decomposing joint and any sector into similar sources and allows you to move between the different uh, hierarchical levels. So that's it. Thank you. We did adaptation studies uh, long ago with Aspen Adventure School. And and after adapting, we go back to the central mass of Lots of literature about adaptation. If you go back to the same kinematics, even our own papers, I don't know. You, we can argue. I, the one thing is, I don't, I, I don't agree. I don't think that dynamics does not play a role. Okay. However, I, I believe that there's a lot of representation in the brain of kinematics, of motion, of segments, of thoughts. Okay. That does have to go through the dynamic execution and things, etc. There's also evidence from neurophysiology. A lot of the Andy Schwartz work, and actually now we have some recent results that are very consistent with segments at the kinematic level. So I think that uh, basically I don't think we disagree, but I think that the kinematics of the motion basic primitives, if I think about them, I think they mean kinematics. Of course, you have to have execution. And you may have different primitives at different levels. Okay? So, so okay. to me, obviously, primitives are trajectories of vertical causes. Obviously. So what are they? So, what are they? Yeah, okay, we can talk later, but different trajectory of what? Okay. I have no problem with this. Okay. But uh, basic, basically, it's not disagreeing because you have this R0, which is some kind of template, okay? So you can translate into reference trajectory. That's the whole idea of virtual trajectory or equilibrium trajectory, if you want to. But, okay. Now, I have a little question for Andrew. Out of the work, uh, the work I look uh, as well, the, the joint work with uh, Daniel and uh, how you can then the, 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 the ideas that for a given motion, uh, there is a natural segmentation that depends on different geometry. 
right? So combination of this is my question. Uh, if uh, uh, when uh, the, this is a question of methodology, then you are considering the okay. and uh, several uh, hypotheses in terms of the, the type of geometry that the, the, uh, the, the some part of the motion uh, is taking uh, into account. And then for that, uh, you are uh, supposing uh, a given geometry, another one, and then you, you take the part that fits the best with the data. And then we give a natural segmentation. But the question is, is your basis risk enough to have a total segmentation of that, or, or you are forced to, to have some uh, combination and... Uh, this is, this is a theoretical model, which is a theory, okay? Like a reference projection, it's a theory, okay? But, uh, but the idea first, that, for example, we didn't put in a projected geometry. So if uh, we have the, the, this is a realization to 3D, but there is, we know there is a difference between the behavior close to the body and far away from the body. So we may have to add, for example, projected geometry. It is true that this, at uh, this stage, the model is more data fitting, okay, to actually tracking a trajectory. But I think the strength of this uh, tool or whatever theory is that you can also maybe predict paths. Because if you have geod geodesics and any of these uh, different geometries, then that will be the path that people select to, to produce. We have not done that yet, but it also it also predicts different timing basically. So this is something to be to still be developed. So yeah. Uh, the, 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 again, my comment is about the, the key point uh, in, in the uh, in the optimal control world. We have that problem depends fully from the basis you are raising uh, at, the, at the very beginning, and uh, we, we have shown, for instance, that some basis can be intrinsically wrong because the, the structure of the basis by itself induce some properties of symmetry, for instance, yeah. which are not in the experiment. And, uh, yeah. Actually, I believe in it. The strength of it is also in the symmetry. So the talk about using it is a symmetry, a basis for symmetry. So if you have movements that are invariant, if I move different parts of the workspace, different time, different amplitude, different angles, what are the basic, basic templates that may be our representative? Okay? That's the best plan to do. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. I have a question about uh, the two parts for the journey, not the last thing. It has been uh, seen that the, the, the order of the problem of life changes. Do you have a stabilization? Around the two part problem. Do you think that in this case there may be a kind of geometry according to the bottom of the general system? Okay, so in our original paper with Ben Ken, we actually talked about it because Piazel, actually, the famous Piazel, was talking about different movements between different geometries from topology to more Euclidean geometry when we children are. Painting, okay? So they paint something which is look topological, but we say that you have the inverse. So you move to, from something which is more Euclidean in children in terms of a drawing, okay? There is work on babies and something which is more equilibrium. So this is an idea, maybe worthwhile to test in uh, children drawing something that may be worth it. Well. <coughs> Actually, uh, it's a comment, and it's a comment to the discussion between Jim Paul and Tama and maybe Jason about the segmentation. The, uh, I think the, the discussion was the, if the segmentation should be lit enough or segmentation is related to the goal of the motion. There are many discussions, but the segmentation is basically finite. And uh, because of that, we need to segment, and we can segment. It is, it is totally continuous space. There's no reason to segment, right? I think the segmentation is based on 
it's my my first of all that segmentation is based on the way how human uh, uh, perceive or how human uh, understand the notion about ourselves. So the because of that the the variety of motion is finite and the classified. And uh, I think the, the I'm a, a bit uh, uh, concerned about the discussion on the goal oriented segmentation. And uh, goal is very uh, high level and the one sided uh, description of the motion. So motion is of course we can tell uh, my behavior is to be making money or be, being happy, but the, the details motion is more more than that, right? So I, I think finding the purpose of goal for the motion is a bit too uh, uh, dangerous and too, uh, I guess, it's subjective. Maybe objective, I should say. So anyway, the, I like the idea to segment based on the motion itself or physics itself, than including the type kind of discussions. And I think the, uh, the, the I have a, some, a little question about the Jason talk and the Thomas question, but I just wanted to comment on the, 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 the idea, basic idea of segmentation. So maybe not such incremental, relating to what I also said, what you said, is this idea of the power law are over also very strong power laws are very strong in perception. So there is a lot of work from Viviani and other people speaking that uh, perception also people prefer motion that obeys some kinematic laws of motion in perception. So 